Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come along and do this talk this afternoon. And I'm really delighted to see uh, paediatric rhinology <laughs> as a specialty because there's so much there and I have so much to talk about. So I've been asked to talk about coenal atresia and nasal stenosis. So um, putting it together with learning objectives, it, the coenal atresia surgery is something that's not strictly uh, on if you look at your syllabus but actually there are PBAs there are sort of PBAs for it and the uh, logbook and it comes under a number of categories. What I'm proposing to do today is just to give you a bit of a background of these conditions make sure that you can go away at the end of the day knowing all the key facts about them how to manage them what your options are what the complications are and you know some top tips uh, which i which have helped me over the years and you know there are lots of ways to deal with these conditions and what i'm talking about today on my own so no good talk is a start is a, a good talk unless you start at the beginning with embryology and you might think why are we putting this in but these are the sorts of questions that rear their head in the mcqs you know so embryology, well, the nasal coeni are really developed within the first trimester. And when I was training, it was all about the buccopharyngeal membrane. But recent years, there's been an awful lot more about the misdirection of neural crest cell migration because so many children with conditions like Treacher Collins um, have um, coenal atresia. So uh, at the moment, I think there's more of a feeling that it's number four. But what are the things you need to know? Well. It's rare, it's between six and 8,000 live births. It depends which article you read and which book you read. Um, it's certainly the most common uh, neonatal uh, uh, abnormality of the nose and it's more of a problem for girls than boys. The literature often talks about 90% bony, 10% membranous. Uh, I don't know what other people feel, but I feel it's far more mixed that I see than pure bone. Unilateral is more common. And uh, a lot of them, there are other comorbidities in about two thirds of patients. And, you know, sort of few curveball questions I have seen on MCQs is that there's slightly more in twins and it affects all races equally. So I said that a lot of other comorbidities are associated with coenal atresia, and I'm sure all of you will think charge immediately and, and, and quite rightly so. But actually, cruzons, treacher collins, and other conditions, polydactyly, synostosis, or any other cleft or, or palatal problem uh, can have a coenal atresia. So coenal atresia, um, charge syndrome, it's important that uh, you know the mutation of CHD7 gene and the TCOF gene for treacher collins, and know what uh, charge is, because again, for those of you training with exams, next year um, this is what the sorts of things that you'd be expected to know but what really matters for all of these children are that this is all a, this is really a team specialty you need your colleagues you need your genetics colleagues pediatricians intensivists craniofacial the list is endless because these children require multiple specialties involved in their care throughout their childhood so what is the main problem with the children? Well, you know, we go around talking about children being um, obligate nasal breathers, but does anybody really, has anyone really stopped and thought about why can't they breathe through their mouth? Um, and there's a lot of thought that this is mother nature's way of stopping children from aspirating when they're feeding. But if you ask a child to put their tongue out, you will often see the larynx, you'll see the epiglottis come into view. So when a child is, is trying to swallow, the epiglottis comes forward and it almost, and the larynx gets lodged, if you like, between the soft palate and the nasopharynx, and they completely obstruct. And the same sort of mechanism occurs when they try to breathe in and out. So they are totally reliant on their nose. And that's a key point for all of the, the cases today. So the signs and symptoms of coenal atresia, well, they can vary from um, an emergency neonatal respiratory uh, problem right through to, to nothing at all, depending on whether you're talking bilateral or unilateral. So the bilateral one is the one that everybody's really interested in and, and concerned about. And of course, these babies, they have complete nasal obstruction at birth. It's apparent immediately. But the, the, the interesting thing about these children is when they're crying and gasping, they are pink, their sats are good. 
it's when you try and feed them, it's when you let them sleep that you run into difficulties. And you often hear them, people talk about cyclical breathing. Um, so when you go in and you see this child crying with sats of 98, don't be led, don't, don't, don't write them off as they've been okay. You need to see them sleeping or at least see them trying to feed. The unilateral, well, there's a huge variety of presentations. Um, uh, can be just a discharging nostril. Um, some children don't feed well in their early years and they may not uh, thrive. Could be an incidental finding. And in fact, two of my, uh, I've had two really interesting cases of, of older teens who've come along, who've had a coenal atresia and they have attended because they've got new boyfriends and girlfriends and there's an aroma when they're uh, kissing. So they've asked for their coena to be sorted out. So let's talk about the neonatal emergency problem. So the baby is born, it's in trouble, it can't breathe. In my experience, the neonatologists usually work out what's going on fairly quickly and they put an age appropriate ET tube in. But you know, if you are called to see a baby on the unit where it's just been born and you're not sure, and of course now you're not able to do a flexible nasal endoscopy, you've got to have some tricks up your sleeve to work out what's going on. So, you can use a spatula for misting. You can dangle a tissue in front of the nose and see if it moves. You could get a suction catheter. And I'm always amazed at how many people make a wrong diagnosis with the suction catheter because they, they go for the black suction catheter, which is a 10 French and it's too big. So, and then if you go for the six French, which is the green one, it curls up in the nose. So the key from here is blue suction catheter size eight to get the best results. You, you could always um, put some dye in the nose and have a look in the oropharynx 20 minutes later and see if it's there. Um, and if you're in a really posh unit, you might even have uh, acoustic rhinometry. But you know, the bottom line is we all know we're going to have to get some imaging and get some, uh, get some scans done. So, oh, I should have just said, uh, there is the McGovern, the McGovern nipple, which you see in the photograph here, is a big so feeding teat that McGovern adapted with some straps to hold it in place to keep the mouth open. And some dummies can be adapted. I've personally never seen them or used them, but you do read about them quite a lot. So you get your imaging and you can see a huge variety of, of scans. Um, uh, by, first of all, you'll find out whether it's bilateral or unilateral. Um, you'll get an idea of whether you're dealing with thin bone, thick bone, a mixture. Um, but the importance with the scans, I always find the HCL the most useful, but the important with the scans is you look in all three planes because the skull base and the other structures are, are always a surprise. And I'll come to that a little bit later. So this is a child, this is uh, my uh, COVID coenal atresia who came into uh, hospital not that long ago, uh, was born with uh, bilateral coenal atresia. And a bed, for those of you, I don't know whether I can use a, oh, I can. So you, you look at the axial and you see here, you know, this looks very straightforward, some nice bilateral, looks soft tissue. A neonatal nose is a lovely thing. If you've got no meconium and mucus in there, you've got all your turbinates beautifully on display and often a little buller if you're lucky. And then as you go back through the nose, you'll see the airways are lovely. When you get to the posterior nose, this area here is the coena. So your target area for surgery can be just two, three, four millimeters in diameter with these babies. And sometimes if you look here, the Voma can be quite thick and in the way. So there are lots of keys to look for before you embark on any surgery. So surgery you want to do for the bilateral cases, you're really looking to do it in the first week of life. They'll be usually in a, a pediatric intensive care unit tubed with an orogastric uh, feed. And your plan is you need to open those coena and you don't want to remove all the nasal structures and affect their facial growth and you'd like them to go home soon and you don't want them coming back in for too many dilatations. So there's lots, to, there's lots of different techniques advocated. Um, certainly when I started, I started out with the transpalatal, which is, a, a, as a surgeon, it's a lovely operation. It's a shame about the flat necrosis and the fistulae and the, the palatal abnormalities that arise from it. But for, for seeing the coena, it's a really good, 
it's a really good technique. So this picture, I'm sorry, it's not the best, but imagine you're you're sitting in the tonsil position. There's the there's the tonsil gag. There's the uvula, and you used to inject into the greater palatine foramen, and then a big U-shaped incision right the way from the maxillary tuberosity on each side, and then you reflect the the, the palatal flap away from you. So you had this wonderful vision of of where you want to go. Um, but uh, I'm pleased to say we don't do that anymore. I have certainly heard of colleagues who do a procedure where they do it. Uh, they put the drill in the nose and the finger in the mouth and they palpate the nasopharynx. I've heard of people doing it. Again, it's not something I have any experience of doing. But the bottom line is, you know, you're, you're all trained to do endoscopic nasal surgery. Um, it is the most successful with the, the lowest complications. And I've put this bottom slide on here to remind me to talk to you about the 120 degree endoscope because I absolutely love this for Coena. Um, you're sitting in your tonsil position, you use your pillar retractor to lift up the soft palate, you use your 120 endoscope and you have the most lovely view of where you're um, operating. So the unilateral treatment options, well it's the same surgery um, but uh, Obviously, it's better if you operate on the children when they're older because they've got a bigger nose and uh, they have less problems and less stenosis. But do beware that some babies with unilateral coena lotetresia do have breathing difficulties. They do get sleep apnea. I'm oh, sorry about the spelling. Um, and there is documentation of death with unilateral coena lotresia where a child has fallen asleep breastfe breastfeeding where the patent nostril has been occluded against mum. So the surgery, what do I do? Well, I'll see if I'm video. So I sit in the tonsil position. I use adrenaline, one in 10,000 to decongest. I use the four millimeter endoscope wherever I can because you know, the, the ala of the nose stretches. The 2.7 bends, it doesn't give a good picture. Um, I use the 120 to look in the postnasal space so that I know where I'm going. And then I tend not to drill if I can avoid it. I use a combination of backbiters, kerosens to remove the bone. And I don't use it, I don't remove a huge amount of the boma. So if I was to stop, the, if I bring this picture back, is you have to sort of get your head around the anatomy of the nose when you're doing when you're so used to doing fez in your fez position. So this is the nasal floor, there's the septum, and there's the lateral wall. It, it's just a mindset really of working that way. So this is a, a, a nice case where you look in and you can see, it's just looking at you, that membranous coena. You look down there and you can see where you need to go and it's lovely. And if I see that, I will probe it with a sucker or a urethral sound or whatever I have, just to see if I can punch through into the postnasal space. Before going any further though, I always want to just check that I'm there. So this is where the 120 endoscope really comes into its own because you can look in and what you would like to see is you'd like to see your sucker coming through that atretic plate. It's when you put your probe in, you look in the postnasal space and you see nothing, you just think, oh my God, where's my probe? And uh, it happens. So this is the sort of picture I like to see. There's my probe coming through the atretic plate. Once I've seen that, then I'm happy you can just get on and remove as much of that as possible. Be mindful when you're removing the lateral part of the coenate, do not go past the eustachian tube cushion. And I don't take the whole Voma, I just take a nice big V out of it. And I'll come to that in a minute. Sometimes the coena atresia is not truly coena, it can be a posterior stenosis. So you end up with a tunnel. So here's the membrane, then there's a long tunnel and there's the coena with the lateral wall going this way. So when you deal with those cases, you've almost got a long nasal stenosis before you actually get into the postnasal space. And you end up with something like this at the back of the nose. And, and these uh, can be quite challenging. To remove some of the bone, well, as I say, one of the night tips is if you've got a unilateral, use the good nostril. Put your backbiter down the good nostril and come in from the back. With the bilaterals, obviously you need to give yourself, you need to make yourself a good nostril before you can go anywhere else. 
And this is what they look like. So that child that I, I spoke to, I showed you the scans for. So four weeks later, I don't use any stents, but this is the back of the vomer. You end up, they off, they all start, they all still nose down to a degree, but this is what I'm hoping to see, enough that I can get a balloon into it. And I find that the actual coanal area itself always closes, but the bit, that V that I take off the septum will stay open. So this whole talk about stents, do we, don't we? How are we going to use them? What are you going to use? How long do you leave them? It's really controversial. Um, I haven't, the last stent I used was 14 years ago. I, I don't use them I, I, for anybody now. I had a lot of trouble with them uh, at the beginning uh, with parents in and out with granulations stent problems that I've just stopped and I discuss it with the parents up front but there's a lot of evidence over and there's a lot of evidence out there now lots of units saying they don't find them useful either the next big question is do you use mitomycin you know this is one of these um, fibroblast inhibitors you know and again certainly in the 90s gosh this was very sexy for all sorts of work particularly coena because you've got a circular hole and you the circular holes are much more likely to, to close up and there was lots of discussion about what dose how we're going to use it what are the side effects do you irrigate it don't you irrigate it my personal experience, I had a lot of trouble with it. I had a lot of fibrin debris at the end that used to block the coena. So I used to have to go back to clear the now patent coena with all the fibrin slough that the mitomycin had formed. So again, I haven't used that for over a decade. But again, there's lots in the literature if you're interested. Um, and I don't think anybody really knows. Everybody has their own view on it. So I thought I'd just share with you a couple of pitfalls. Um, so if you, this was a 13-year-old boy who came to see me with a coenal atresia um, and you look at the scan and you see, well, okay, there's a nice bony atresia there. So I'm going to take you through a couple of scans. I won't tell you what the problem is and then I'll, see, and then I'll tell you the pitfall I fell into with this one. So there he is. There's his first ACL. I've just taken a couple of coronals through the, uh, through the child to just take you through. Uh, there's another one there. And I don't know if you realise what I did wrong attempting a coenal atresia in this child. More obvious there. Yep, I didn't see it. There's a submucous cleft. Um, and he did not have a bifid uvula. He had a stubby, uh, normal looking uvula. And you ended up, you end up with problems. So he ended up with a real pinhole perforation, which fortunately uh, healed without any intervention within a couple of days. But uh, it was a good learning curve. Another pitfall um, is uh, looking at some of the babies when you look at their early scans. So if, look at this one. So this is a little girl who was born with a bilateral coenal atresia. So you see all her ache seals here. Um, nothing unusual, bone all appears fine. You look at the, so you look at the, look at the coronals, look at the ache seals, and it doesn't matter what level ache seal you take, there is no patent postnasal space. She doesn't have anywhere to open into. So she got a tracheostomy and she did really well. And she came back when she was three and we rescanned her. And this is her ache seal and she's lying on her back and you can see the fluid level. And the back of the nostril is actually the clivus. But actually, when you look at her sagittal, her bony plate is completely continuous with the nasal floor. And so if you put your endoscope through her nose, the back wall that you're looking at is in actual fact her clivus, and it's not her coena at all. So this is what it looks like. So now, just to orientate yourself, there's the septum, there's the lateral wall, there's the floor. So when you look back there, you would think, well, if that's the inferior turbinate coming in here, it's going to be somewhere in that area there. That's where you'd expect it to be. So, but actually where it was, was down here. And this is the roof of the nasal break. So this is where I thought it should have been. And actually we, her coena was there. So clinically in theater, it was almost as though I was making a hole in her palate. Uh, and then again, you put, your, you put your 120 in, you find out you're in the right place and you can open it. So beware the craniofacial children with the funny skull bases. The other thing I would just point out about her 
as well is just look at that decline. They talk about the, slo the sloping skull base. There's not much sloped about that. It's a bit vertical, isn't it, with hand holes? So beware. So complications. Well, the biggest complication we all worry about is wax going to reese the nose, particularly if you're not using stents. Um, and the literature says it's between 1.5 and 3 operations per patient. Um, nice paper last year says, uh, well, basically told us what we already know, that babies under six months, under five kilos and bilateral have a higher rate of stenosis, which is what we, we know. But in 2010, um, I think it was, that I went to a meeting where they said they were no longer going to operate on these. We're just going to, uh, less is more, they were going to start dilating them and not doing any further surgery to these small pinholes. And actually, that's exactly what I do. And I do feel certainly in my practice, it's made a big difference and I don't have to do nearly as many um, procedures now. Do remember other complications as well, nasal adhesions, septal perforations, septal deviations, ALA deformities if you're going to put stents in. So having taken you through my pitfalls, what do I put on the consent form? Well, um, it gets longer as I get older, but uh, the main thing is I tell them that there's a, they, they will have a degree of restenosis, but I don't tell them a number. I just say that each child is individual. I tell them they'll have nosebleed, um, but not one that will drip in a drip, drip, drip in a bowl, but they'll need a tissue box to wipe because I don't put any, uh, any packs in. And then I give them all the usual talks that we would with anybody about the risk to the skull base. I've never seen a CSF leak with it, but there's time. Perforation of the palate and all the other ones that you would normally do for anybody having endoscopic uh, sinus surgery. And I think for me with, uh, with coenolotresia, uh, as I said, I would stand at the, do it in the tonsil position. And I know most of you, if you're not used to doing that, would feel much, more be much better standing on the patient's right side doing it as per affairs. But I, I really think tonsil position is the safest way to do this. And it lends itself to the instruments we use. Um, I don't remove too much Voma, just a nice B. And I balloon dilate the coena when they come back. Double check your imaging, don't get caught out with uh, not checking all planes. And actually nowadays, um, I'm starting to wonder whether I should start navigating some of these craniofacial patients. I think it might be, uh, uh, it might be easier. I, I don't know what everybody else's experience is. I haven't done over the last two, uh, the last 15, 16 years, but I should start, I've, I have done one or two recently and it's an awful lot easier with it. So I'll stop there from, is there any, or should I just carry on? Oh. There's only one question, Anne-Marie, would you oh. carry on or would you take yeah. it? Well, I'll carry on then, I'm conscious of time. So, um, so the other one to talk to you about is piriform aperture stenosis, CPAS, or some people insist on putting the N in. It's one of those bug bearing things, isn't it? Um, so again, like everything in Pete, it can be isolated or it can occur with something else. Um, most people know about it because of a single incisor, the mega incisor, but not every baby will have that. Um, and it's about one in 25,000 live births. So it's not common unless you're, well, it's pretty common in Birmingham, but I don't know about other parts of the country. And it can also be associated with pituitary dysfunction and other brain problems. So again, this is going to require MDT and uh, just teamwork. Now, the symptoms are going to be very much like we've discussed for coenolotresia, only this time you might, you will get misting on your spatula or your, your tissues wafting in the breeze and, you know, so you've got to think about what else could it be. So the differential diagnosis for a baby, a newborn with a blocked nose, I've made a list there and, you know, just have those in mind when you're seeing them. I would just point out you don't see the mega incisor in the baby, you see it on the scan. It, 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 you don't see it until it erupts a couple of months later. So again, you're going to need a scan and what you're, the piriform aperture is the narrowest, most anterior part of the nose and what happens here is the maxillary uh, process just overgrows or it is really medial. Um, and the diagnostic test is 11 millimetres. You want 11 millimetres across there. Um, below that, you've got, um, you would fall into this diagnosis. So 
it's not about the, the the number is important for the diagnosis but actually it's not important for the treatment i've seen babies with eight and nine millimeters who need surgery and babies with five millimeters who are fine. so with that you can try many of them will manage well with medical treatment saline steroids decongestants you can still use what we've talked about for the coenal anesthesia the mcgovern and as i said before you don't forget to scan the pituitary and the midline. But the surgical management, well, for me, this is, I would do a sublabial approach. I use one or two bits of dimal to, to remove this, uh, this bony aperture in here. So one of the problems when you're starting out with this is you do your sublabial incision here, and then you start raising your flap up. And you have to remember, this can be just two or three millimeters. And the next thing you know, whoo, there's the infraorbital nerve. So it, you really have to be very careful to make sure that you're in this area. And don't instrument the nose too much, because if you've got instruments down there as well, you'll end up with adhesions, which is the last thing you need. So you need the nasal lining intact. You need to be coming in from underneath to remove all this bone, to buy yourself space to put an NPA in. Now, some people put stents in and leave them in. I put an MPA in. If I can get a small one in each nostril, I will do. They don't link at the back like you would for a coenal atresia. But if I can't get two in, I'm happy with one. And then what I would do is I would change it on the ward every few days so that you try and keep both nostrils going. And then lastly, I'll just finish off with a few words on mid nasal stenosis. I find this probably the hardest of the lot to deal with um, and actually it's a lot more common than you give it credit for and in fact uh, um, and if you get a child with a stenosis of any sort within the nose think of one of the craniosynostosis think craniofacial um, I've had a baby recently who was born looked very normal um, had a nasal stenosis we've drilled it out we've put an MPA in and she's three months old now and uh, it's the the cruzons is becoming apparent so again just bear in mind you need your colleagues get the other specialties involved and when you see this just think about those other conditions and this is the scan of the young girl i was telling you about recently there's just a huge amount of bony overgrowth there on the lateral walls she has got patent air passages but they're not uh, they're not uh, great and certainly not sufficient for her to thrive and do well without surgical intervention the management is exactly the same as we've talked through. You have to dilate it or remove it. Um, and uh, if you are, if they do then develop and, and, and be, they do declare themselves as the child grows to be one of this craniofacial spectrum, you may end up with a tracheostomy, especially if there's multi-level airway pathology. So just my last slide, I've a couple of slides there. I've made a few points about nasal steroids. Do tell the parents that you're using them have a plan for how long you're using them and tell them they're off license because if you're giving them to uh, parents of a neonate they read the enclosed instructions and flixinase says not like not license but under 16 so they would just think you're completely bonkers and i would just point out the bnf recommends that you should be monitoring patient parameters even with nasal corticosteroids so i put the question out to you all how many of you are weighing and measuring the heights of the children you are putting on these clocks and i think you know there comes a limit to what we can do for everybody but uh, that's it thank you very much and louise thank you that was an excellent talk i really enjoyed it um can i ask you a couple of questions from the chat if that's okay yes so the first is, do you use any septal or lateral wall mucosa flaps to prevent restenosis? Uh, I did. I went through about two years of trying a variety of them and I found in the really young children, the, the babies who have the high rate of restenosis, it is so fiddly to do that I don't, and it didn't alter any of my results at all. So no, I don't. I stopped, uh, I've stopped raising flaps. I probe, I find where the coena is and I just widen it. I think the shape of your coena, if you can get a letterbox coena, I think you stand a better chance than a circular coena, is, is, is my instinct with this. 
Thank you. The next person says, thank you for a great practical talk on management and pitfalls in Coin Latrizia. You mentioned taking a V off the septum. Could you elaborate a bit on that? So the, 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 vo the Voma edge, you can, if you stick right to the very edge of it, you can remove a wider base. But as you move towards the quadrilateral cartilage, you make it more uh, V-shaped. It, it, just, it just seems to not close up as quickly and it will leave you with a very small pinhole when you come back to dilate in a place that's easily accessible. And as long as you do good bony work with the rest of your coena at your first operation, the ballooning is great. If you don't make your, your coenotomy big enough at the beginning, it, it, it's the ballooning, you're not gonna win. You've gotta do it right on the first uh, operation. And then ballooning, a, a ballooning which is day case in and out works beautifully. Thanks, Anne Louise. The next question is Can you repeat the C2 criteria for the CNPAS? What is the 11 millimeters that you were referring oh, to? The 11 millimeters is the width of the piriform aperture from left to right. Um, and then the next question is Which nasal steroids do you use in infants and at what dosage? Um, I use Flixinase nasals and I give a dose of half a nasal per nostril once a day. And I will tell parents that I will start out for a maximum of three weeks. And that's, and then I take it on, after that, it depends on the symptoms. And then the next question is, in the case of the bilateral treaty that you were talking about with the tracheostomy, at what age do we need to operate on the coin? I think the child you talked about, you operated on when he was three, yeah. Yeah, we've had two, so, uh, well, I've had two such cases where that there's just not been a post-nasal space. The, the, the posterior wall is vertical, so the back of the nose is the clivus. Um, one, we managed to get the trachea out age three. The second one, I got the trachea out when she was seven. The second one was a charge, uh, charge syndrome. Anne-Marie, this is a question for me. Do you find that in, in children who have these micro deletions, which are a bit different from the known syndromes, they tend to be more difficult to manage and, and have a higher rate of restenosis than... Yeah, these are the children I find of more of a nasal stenosis than a true coenal atresia. And that's why this particular subgroup I find are more challenging than the coenal atresia kids. Yeah, and they are a problem throughout the whole time. You, you, you have all the infant problems, then they have adenoids when they're 18 months and they're back in your clinic again. And then they get a bit of sleep out there for a few years and, and, and it just rumbles on. Um, and then they get rhinitis if they're really unlucky. And uh, uh, so they're with you until, until you can get them into a transition clinic to the adult specialty. It, it's long haul for these kids. Um, and then I think we'll just take two or three more questions and, and we'll move on. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer this question or if there is an answer to it, but how many times do you tend to need to repeat the balloon dilatation for a child? Um, I've had one child, I thought you might, I've had one boy, my, my all time record is a little boy with charge and he had nine balloons. So he is, uh, I'm pleased to say he's a teenager now, but he had nine balloons and his family write to me regularly. But apart from him, I, I don't think anybody goes past three. So because I don't stent, I do the first operation and then I don't wait for them to re nose. I will give the parents a provisional TCI date for balloon dilatation when they leave the hospital. I mean, obviously they can come in at any time sooner, but I have a footprint on an operating list for them because it will, it will, it will stenose. Um, and then after the first one, so all parents are told there'll be one, and then this is for the bilaterals, and then for the unilaterals, I don't give them one. I say to them, they may need one, and they contact me. But three is about, as, I don't think, apart from that one boy with nine, I can't think of anybody who's gone over three, apart from him. <laughs> and, and the last question, I think, before we, we, we wrap up is, what is the youngest age for flixinase nasals that you've used and, and its safety profile? And could it also be applied in rhinitis that's resistant to all other treatments? <laughs> uh, I online uh, and use. Uh, uh, the youngest I've used it in is newborns. Um, it's not, it's completely off license, as you know. 
Um, the dosage that we use with the nasals is 400 micrograms in the nasal, but, and, and the manufacturers have said age 16. I would just point out the respiratory unit used the same medication, same dose in an inhaled format at age four. So I, I'm a little less worried when the children get to four, five, six, but in that first four years, um, I, I, I think all you can do is it's all about risk benefit, isn't it? If you've got a baby with rhinitis, even the neonatal rhinitis you, it's either that or they can't breathe and you're going to have to intervene surgically with something so I think you just have to tell the parents what you're doing I would use it from day one thanks Anne Louise I think what we'll do is we'll wrap up the one thing I do want to say to you is that loads of people have come through on the chat to say how much they've enjoyed the talk oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much